Vaults are a topic we've returned to again and again over the years, as we've looked at the lore of the world of Fallout. Some have had twisted social experiments, some man-eating plants and spore viruses, and some just strange experiments that were bound to fail from the word go. Vault 118 isn't like any of them. It's unique in that, from the very beginning, and arguably before, if you count the construction work, the subjects were the ones that seized control, subtly manipulating things until they were ready to take power. This had resulted in a unique situation where, as we shall see, vault themselves became the experiment. Honestly, it's very satisfying what happened to the lone vault employee here. Maybe not so much to the other people who were meant to be involved, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to all of that very soon. First of all, if all goes according to plan, this should be going up just before the holidays. If so, I hope you all have a good one, and if I don't leave a post before it, have a fantastic new year. If you do enjoy this video, likes, sharing, comments, and general engagement really help out the performance, and as such are greatly appreciated. If you have any video suggestions, please leave them in the comments section, or on one of the community posts. If this is the first video of mine you've seen in a while, you've missed quite a few, and you might want to enable notifications so you don't miss future ones. Now, let's take a look at this insane vault. The vault itself is located underneath the Cliff's Edge Hotel. I'll give you one guess where the hotel is located. For this reason, I will briefly cover the terminal located in the hotel lobby. Then I'll get right to the vault. I might cover the rest of the hotel in another video, but there isn't really that much in it given the damage apart from ghouls, a trapper, and a few bodies. A word of warning, a lot of the information we get regarding the people here, if you want to call them that, and the vault itself, comes in the course of the brain dead quest that is triggered when we come here. To that end, this will be a dialogue heavy video. I will include timestamps if you want to skip past them. There is one terminal in the main hotel, and we can find it inside the collapsed lobby. Now it immediately brings up the construction of the second wing of the premier part of the hotel. While we don't know what this is just yet, we get some information here, and more in the vault itself. The first entry is, unfortunately, corrupted in some way. So the second entry is the one we want to look at. The Premier Visitor Instructions Entry. This entry immediately brings up the vault, which means it wasn't a secret among the staff. Moreover, given one can make reservations, not likely to the wider public either. Though, you know, given there are vault tech containers outside, and you know, a massive vault door, this really shouldn't have been a secret to anyone at all. We get told the vault is accessed via the basement, which is located at the far side of the lobby, through some rubble. This is what first sets you off through the hotel. Someone called Maxwell is the vault slash hotel receptionist, and they mention a speakeasy feel to the area where they enter. We'll see very soon how the outside of the vault achieved this. The other entry is just about nearby attractions, so we'll be skipping it as it doesn't really add anything. Once we have traversed the hotel, we come to a set of stairs that lead down to the basement that have some money on them. We actually see a lot of duffels of money throughout the hotel. I think there are three possibilities for this. One, guests just hiding theirs, or they are bringing too much with them on holiday. Two, guests who are heading into the vaults and bringing as much with them as they could. Or three, this is related to an event we shall learn about inside the vault. At the bottom of the stairs, there are a lot of dead ghouls, and it seems the automated defenses mowed them down. These turrets do not attack us, so either they have a way to differentiate non-humans, or someone is controlling them. The entrance to the vault is via the elevator at the back of this room, and it takes you down even further into the hotel. Coming out of the elevator, on the left we can find an employee area. Honestly, this just looks like where they did the laundry. So again, the vault wasn't secret at all. Its purpose? Sure, but we'll get into that soon. Before we open the vault itself, I want to talk about all these chairs. They're very fancy looking, and the way they are set up seems to suggest that one was able to come and go from the vault as they pleased or at least come down here and lounge around outside of it before you were sealed in. This seems to be the speakeasy vibe they were talking about, which also explains the curtains. Given what we find out about the experiment, this all makes sense. For now, when we arrive, it looks like the vault is locked up tight. However, when we try and open it, we are greeted with a conversation by a Mr. Handy that just raises a lot of questions. Are 
you the detective we sent for? Why do you need a detective? Well, there's been a suspicious death in the hotel. We need someone to investigate. Are you the detective we sent for? Maybe. Tell me what's going on. There's been a suspicious death. We sent someone for help, but no one has come to help us yet. Are you the detective we sent for? Yes, I'm the detective. Oh, thank goodness. Let me just open the door for you. This conversation gives us some information and, as I said, raises some questions. The Mr. Handy keeps asking for a detective, specifically one that they apparently sent for, and that there's been a murder in the hotel. Now the fact that he refers to the vault as a hotel is the first odd thing. Yes, it is underneath one. We don't know the relation between the two, which will get answered when we find the overseer. The other question to raise is, who did they send to get help? The vault is locked up tight, and they're on a radioactive fog shrouded island. How would they even know who to go to? Depending on how you find this place, you'll have encountered who they sent, but given it isn't how I find the place, we shall get to that later. There is actually a bit of dialogue later that fills you in on which robot they actually sent, so when we reach that dialogue, we'll discuss it then. Additionally, note that we couldn't open the vault with our Pip-Boy, this Mr. Handy did, and only after it decided to let us in. This implies that those inside still retain full control, and is the first hit that vault no longer wields power here. After we enter the vault, we can have another conversation with this Mr. Handy, called Maxwell, and get more information about what is going on. We have many important residents and they are very worried. What happened? Who died? It's Mr. Parker, the primary owner and financier for the hotel. This is just a disaster. Have a look at the crime scene for clues. And when you're ready, we can discuss your findings. They're at the crime scene again. Don't they realize that they're going to disturb the evidence? You'd better come with me, detective. For some reason, it thinks we are the police. This is a little odd, as you know, society has collapsed, and it knows it's in a vault, and what the vault is for. I have to wonder then, did they just send somebody out with a message for the police, and expect them to come? From what we saw earlier, there are turrets active in the hotel, presumably controlled from somewhere here. I would think then, that they have some sort of surveillance to at least see the disrepair of the hotel above, and you know, the feral necrotic people. Regardless, we also learn of the victim, and Ezra Parker, the financier of both the hotel and the vault. This becomes very important later, and explains how they managed to take control. We're asked to take a look at the crime scene, and told that there are others already there, possibly disturbing it. So of course we head straight over. It is here that this vault and quest go completely tits up. shouting but the detective has arrived and shall begin the investigation henceforth please return to your rooms until the detective has examined the crime scene and had a chance to come speak with you yeah all the residents are robobrains literally all of them the only other thing in here are the robots that maintain the vault and serve the residents now i know what you're probably thinking this actually makes a lot of sense as a vault experiment and seems like one of the better ideas. I agree. Except this was not the vault experiment. At all. As we shall see, the residents did all of this. We'll get to the how and the why of it soon. For now, we have a murder to investigate. When we walked in, we are introduced to two of the five surviving Robobrains here, Santiago and Keith. Santiago is exclaiming about how meaningful and emotive 
the death of Ezra was, while Keith says he's sick. Gotta agree with Keith here. We shall learn more about these two very soon, along with the other three. For now, we need to inspect the crime scene, and see what we can deduce. Looking at the body, we find three things. A smashed in brain enclosure, blood, or what appears to be blood, a can of red paint, and a bat. Now the damage to the brain enclosure was definitely the cause of death. The touch with the blood, that then turned out to be red paint, and then the bat, are just straight up framing attempts. I mean, why would there even be blood, especially given it was the enclosure that was smashed in, not the brain itself? The fact that it leads to the paint that was the source, and the bat, would suggest that whomever owned the bat was being framed by an idiot. Well, this is actually not far from the truth, but we need to talk to a few people here before that. For now, let's get some information from Maxwell regarding the resident's current forms and Ezra. Hello again, detective. Was there anything else? Your residents are robots. Not robots, detective. Well, not exactly, anyway. <laughs> I believe the term they use is robo-brain. Back before the war, the residents decided the best way to wait it out was to put their brains inside robotic chassis. Was there anything else? I'm not sure where I should start. I suppose you should try to figure out how he died, and then who had the means and motive to kill him. Once you have enough evidence, then I suppose you'll need to confront the killer. Was there anything else? Tell me about the victim. Mr. Ezra Parker was the primary owner and financier for the hotel. He had vast experience managing venture projects around the world. It was his idea to have our premier clients become investors in the vault section of the hotel. He worked with Vault Tech to have this built to their every specification. Was there anything else? Never mind. I'll be here should you need me. Maxwell gives us quite a bit to unpack here. First of all, the residents were the ones who made the choice to house their brains inside the bodies they're now in, becoming robo-brains. We'll learn later on how they managed to stay functional all this time, and avoid the usual problem most robo-brains have, becoming as mad as a bag of spiders. That this was their own choice would suggest that vault was not aware of this, at least to begin with, and wasn't part of the original experiment. Maxwell tells us that the residents here, all wealthy, were investors in the vault section of the hotel, which explains why it still refers to it as a hotel. They apparently controlled the specifications to which the vault was built, and also the construction, as will become apparent later. This may or may not have influenced vault choice of the experiment, or they were just well suited to the roles vault needed to fill in. Additionally, we also get information regarding the backgrounds, at least briefly, of the other investors, as well as their order of joining. Keith McKinney and Gil de Brasco were the first to get involved, then a painter named Santiago Avita, who was using Gilda as a subject of their art. This will be relevant later. The last to join were Juliana and Bert Riggs, the wealthiest investors. All of this will become relevant again later, as we learn more about these characters and their relationships and motivations towards each other. Regardless, Ezra is dead now, and it falls to us, crack detective, to solve it. So of course, first of all, we're going to ignore everything about this investigation, and head straight to the Overseer's office, and find out exactly what went down here, to leave the vault as it is. We can head up the stairs behind the body, and come to the first floor of the vault. Here, we can find the entrance to the Overseer's office. It's locked up, but you can either pick it, or use the key you find in Ezra's room, which I'll show you later on. Once inside, we can head up, and we find a beautiful sight. A vault hack employee, in all likelihood the Overseer, given this is their office draped over their desk, long dead from the looks of them. Now I am unsure how this actually came to pass, as there doesn't seem to be a weapon, blood, or any indication of how this could have occurred. The only thing I can really find are the mentats in the bathroom, and I think they are here for a different reason entirely. So, let's address the elephant in the room. This is marvelous. Even with pin particles, you couldn't make a violin small enough to play for them, as we shall learn. The experiment in here was going to be awful, so whatever happened to them, I hope it was slow and painful. Arsehole. Now, let's take a look at their terminal, so we can flesh out what went on in here a bit more. So the first entry is for the overseer's eyes only, and we are immediately told what the experiment is. 
They wanted to test how working class people, the residents of the island, and the wealthy residents of the hotel would function when locked in together. Returning to my earlier points regarding whether or not the investments made here influenced the vault experiment, I don't think this is the case. This entry makes it seem like the goal was always to test the interaction between the working class and the wealthy. If this is the case, they likely approached Ezra. Since they were going to be ultra wealthy in it, vault likely had no issues giving them control over the construction, or taking their money for that matter. We don't have the information yet whether the wealthy class here was made aware of the true goal of this place. The end of it states that the working class is being put in a more inferior wing of the vault. We shall cover this section at the end of our look at this vault. Next is a section titled Operations Protocol Manual, and it has three subsections, Resident Admittance, Preferential Treatment, and Staff Duties and Security. The first entry expands on the overall role of the vault before the war. The wording here suggests that the vault may in fact have been open before the bombs dropped, as it operated in a clandestine capacity in a restricted section of the hotel, which is what we saw as we made our way through it. Though again, restricted doesn't mean secret. This is probably why those seats were placed outside the door. They were already being used. The fancy part was to lure in the test subjects for the first group, the wealthy ones. Once the vault was activated proper, the second wing would open, and the individuals would be selected from the local population, probably in a similar manner that happened to us at the beginning of the game. It finishes by saying they're to be taken through the fancy part before being taken to the inferior section. This was likely done to begin the friction between the two groups. They weren't to be allowed out until the results could be determined, which is important as, from what we saw, this never happened. Moreover, we haven't seen any of these other residents yet. Entry 2 covers how preferential treatment was to be given. The wealthy class was to number no more than 10, and we waited on hand and foot by the robotic staff present in the vault. They were given a free pass in regards to any crimes done to the other group, B. This explains why Maxwell attempted to get the police involved in the first place, as they're not above legal ramifications for actions taken against each other. Class B was to start 300, the assumption being they'd either expand recruitment or children would begin to be born. They were to be put in conditions specifically designed to make them uncomfortable and given as little food as possible. It doesn't state what the rules were, but Group A was meant to judge Group B members if they breached them, and the robots would administer the punishment. So far, this all sounds like an excellent recipe for traditional vault shenanigans. The final entry in this section states that the vault staff were to be kept as small as possible, likely to avoid influencing the results of the experiment. The robot staff are to handle everything else and throughout the vault, we can see them tending to various parts of it. So even after 200 years, this still seems to be working. Overall, we have an experiment that seemed to want to determine what happens when you cram the rich and the poor together, and see what happens when the rich can do whatever they want. I mean, they've likely lived their lives up to this point doing that to a certain extent. So honestly, I don't really think much would have changed. As for the conditions they put them in, I think this was done to test their breaking point, how long can you keep people in squalor before they rise up? All of this sounds like it could have been a lovely shit show for us to stumble onto the aftermath of. But this never happened. Looking at the next section, the Overseer's Logs, we learn how the Robobrain aspect of the guests took the experiment completely off the rails. Hilariously, they call it a change of testing parameters in their first entry. It turns out that one of the wealthy people, who we come to know as Bert Riggs, is part of the Robobrain Research Project at General Atomics, which I believe leads on from some of what we learned from the Automatron DLC. We'll get to that another time. For now, all you need to know is this lad managed to convince everyone to undergo a procedure to have their brains placed inside Robobrain bodies. Given that we can still encounter Robobrains to this day, and these residents are still alive, if not immortal, it has made them incredibly long-lived, as you need to consider they were all in at least their 30s, when they underwent the procedure, and it's been over 200 years since then. Now, the Overseer states that their superiors are intrigued by this idea. I imagine they like the idea of an immortal wealthy class reigning over the vault's residence generation after generation. Additionally, given the vaults were testing possible scenarios that may be encountered in off-world colonization, this actually isn't that unlikely. We've seen several immortality plays and followed so far, including induced ghoulification, and two more means of preserving the human brain, along with Robobrain technology. Additionally, vault themselves attempted to, with Tranquility Lane and the Cryogenics in Vault 111. 
although that could be argued to be more of a leapfrogging through time method as opposed to immortality. Regardless, since becoming a RoboBrain is an option, this could have been employed in off-world colonization, and as such, a situation like this might actually be a valid testing scenario. It's because of this that the powers that be at vault probably thought this was a good idea. After this last entry, things take a dark turn. It's called The Doors Wouldn't Open, and it would seem that all of Test Group B was locked out. Now given that we are also told that the shit wing of the vault wasn't finished, I don't know where they were expected to go. Perhaps they were just going to have to sleep in the hollowed out cave section it was meant to be in. They say that when they tried to trigger the protocol to get them in, the system told them they'd been locked out. Apparently Group A did this. Additionally, Group B doesn't seem to be dead when this happens. Now, I am making the assumption here that the signal was given when the bombs were dropping, so initially it seems odd they managed to survive out there for days. However, given what we know about the fallout, it isn't actually that strange. In the past, we've covered, in the Commonwealth, the stories of people who, despite being stuck outside vaults, didn't die, and in fact managed to form settlements. So they could have survived. We would need to look more at the story of Far Harbor to find out more. Next is the last entry by the Overseer, before their holotape. And it is delicious. It's titled, I Can't Take This, and the wee shit, just after a few weeks, is already breaking. They now realize that they are the experiment. It's no longer about the rich subjugating the poor. It's about a single flesh and blood human being subjected to the whims of the people they initially wanted to experiment on after having their power taken away from them. They seem to be in quite a bit of despair, as these are the only other people they'll have contact with, and they have all the privileges, and they will long outlive them. You know, like they were intending the experiment to be in the first place. Except in that case, hundreds would suffer, unaware of what was going to happen to them as they sought shelter from atomic fire. Now it's just this one rat who was more than happy to do unto others. I think the mentats we found in the bathroom was probably them trying to keep their wits about them as they slowly lost it, or keep up with the mental faculties of the robobrains. I'm not sure whether or not the people here benefited from some increased cognitive ability of their condition, but at the very least Bert was smarter than them, likely Ezra as well. The last thing we need to look at up here is their holotape that fills in some of the blanks with regards to the second wing. Progress on construction of the second wing of the vault is completely stalled. Once the premier area of the vault had been completed, funding seems to have been cut off. My supervisors have informed me that they haven't received payment from Mr. Parker, and vault won't pay out of pocket to continue construction. I've repeatedly approached Ezra about the finances, but he keeps telling me that Mrs. Riggs hasn't transferred the funds. However, when I asked her, Juliana said that she had just given Ezra extra for the gold pane in the rooms. I've hired an investigator to look for signs of embezzlement in a few weeks. So, the Overseer suspects that Ezra is embezzling. They took money from Juliana, another resident here, and likely the other investors, and pocketed it themselves. This was the possible third option I talked about for all the money hidden around the hotel. Though that would be a very strange way to go about hiding it. This resulted in the section of the vault they didn't care about, the second wing, being left unfinished. We saw this in the terminal located in the hotel lobby, so the fancy part was finished far in advance. We'll see just how little work had been done later. I think it's odd that vault Tech didn't want to pay out of pocket to finish it. I mean this was meant to be part of the vault program, and they did get funds for the more expensive part, while the second wing was meant to be much cheaper. You would think they would have taken the savings they got on the main part of it, and finished the rest. Additionally, they were aware this had happened, so why do they still try and get people in when the bombs dropped? Unless at this point, they had already decided to change the experiment to seeing how Robobrain survived, and the effect it would have on their only other employee. On that point, where are the other researchers it mentions? I couldn't find any other bodies in here, so either they never made it, or they've been long disposed of. After we're done admiring this lovely bit of karma, we can return to Maxwell and inform him of the bat that we found, the likely murder weapon. We can also get some information regarding the Overseer's office. Hello again, Detective. Was there anything else? I found the murder weapon. Oh no. That's the bat from Mr. McKinney's movie. You don't think he could be involved, do you? I can't imagine him ever doing such a thing. Was there anything else? 
Never mind. I'll be here should you need me. Hello again, Detective. Was there anything else? The door to the Overseer's office is locked. Oh, yes. Mr. Parker locked it a while back. After finding out that one of the other residents had been inside, said it wasn't safe. If the key isn't on him, it's probably in Mr. Parker's room. Was there anything else? Never mind. I'll be here should you need me. So now we know that Mr. McKinney, who we learn is called Keith, owns the bat that, allegedly, was used to kill Ezra. Additionally, we learn that Ezra was the one who locked up the Overseer's office, as someone else had already been inside. Given what we learned about him from the holotape, it's safe to say the two are related. But before we get to that, it's time to meet our suspects, starting with Keith, who we can find in a room close to the main atrium that Ezra's body was located in. I shall show both his interaction with another resident, Gilda, and his dialogue in full, before we discuss him. I saw the way he looked at you. You gonna tell me that's nothing? It wasn't like that. We were friends. He helped me out of a tight spot or two is all. I couldn't stand by like some pasty-faced Percy while he put the moves on my best girl. But now the law is on our tail. What are we going to do? Come away with me. Let's leave this dark hole of a city behind. We can be in Buenos Aires by tomorrow. Oh, I want to believe you. I do. But never let us go. Then we'll make our stand here. I... I've got a gun for each of us. No, 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 no! The line is... Then we'll make our stand here. Two lovers together with a bullet for each of them. Oh, God. Why can't I ever get that line? Forget it. I can't do this right now. Ugh, fine. I'm going to the beach. How can I help? Did you have questions about the case? Did you have any thoughts about the murder? It's obviously Santiago. He keeps going back to look at the crime scene. I found your baseball bat at the crime scene. Care to explain how it got there? Someone is clearly trying to frame me for the murder. It's probably Santiago. You saw him skulking around the crime scene. What were you and Gilda talking about when I walked in? Hmm? Oh, we were just rehearsing a scene. Nothing to worry about. Maybe later. Okay. Just let me know how I can help. I think you're the murderer. The brain enclosure was smashed in and your bat was at the scene of the crime. What? That makes no sense at all. What motive would I possibly have to kill Ezra? Maybe you could give me a reason it couldn't be you. I... I... I would never harm Ezra, Detective. I was... in love with him. Tell me about you and Ezra. Oh God, I don't know. When we first met him, he was just so mysterious and exciting. It seemed like he had been everywhere and done everything. I convinced Gilda that we should invest in the hotel so I could stay close to him. But he never seemed to realize how I felt. I mean, we spent time together. Going hunting, having drinks, talking about his plans for the hotel. He must have known, but he never said anything. Do you have any idea what it's like to pine for someone for 200 years, Detective? Tell me about yourself. We went over this before, Detective. There's no motive. I... don't know yet, but I'll find the motive. No, you won't, Detective. Because there isn't one. So cars on the table. We are a pretty shit detective. I think it's great that our character is channeling their inner telenovela star and going for the overly dramatic accusations, combined with pretty much admitting they haven't a clue what they're doing. Then again, 
Everyone in this vault is mad, so it's fine. Keith claims that, despite the bat belonging to him, they didn't do it. It must be the other man we saw near the body, Santiago. We'll see what happens with that soon, but for now, let's just say that little scene he was doing with Gilda did have some truth in it, at least in regards to infidelity. But their main argument for why it wasn't them was love. Love for Ezra. Unrequited love for two centuries? Hmm. We can actually find a note to Ezra, presumably undelivered, concealed in a console in their studio. Given it is hidden, I believe Gilda wasn't aware of how Keith felt in regards to Ezra. This may be why, as we learn later, she felt how she did about their relationship and did what she did. What the note also means is Keith is likely telling the truth and isn't making this up for an alibi. Honestly, under normal circumstances, I would say that was a fair motive, but the frame job is too sloppy. Keith himself is an actor, and we can see that the room is set up for recording and capturing scenes. I expect this was built to specification before they made the choice to become a Robobrain. A case off to the side actually tells us that the fence buster, the murder weapon, was used by Keith in a movie called Swing for the Fence. Opposite it, we can find a poster for another movie he was in, called The Fighting Furies, Last Stand at Fort McGee, where, based on the credits in the poster, he seems to be one of the leads. Another funny detail is that, in one of the rooms, we can find a set of rusty dumbbells on the floor. Since he is sharing this room with Gilda, I assume these were his from when he thought he'd be in here with a real body. The beds are likely also unused, as, you know, they can't really sleep in them, and only have these docking stations that likely function as a mix of power supply and diagnostics. All of this aside, after this conversation, we can rule him out and pretty much put Santiago as our next suspect. But first, we can take a look at the room next to this, flanked by two lions. A room that, as it turns out, was Ezra's. Entering the room, we can find a large amount of displayed objects dotted around it. The plaques on these cases help us flesh out Ezra's character and identify the room as his. The spade was used to break ground at a medical research center he both funded and overseen the construction of, called Cardoza, the first example we get of his possible yet dubious philanthropy. We were told by Keith that it seemed he'd been all over the world, so this reinforces that. Next, we pass a hat and vase, though this time, no information is given. The case at the end contains some skulls, and the plaque states he was presented a collection of pygmy skulls as a thank you from a grateful tribe when he saved them from a man-eating tiger. The cynic in me wonders if he didn't just have this wrote and killed the tribe themselves and took the skulls. The next case has three items in it. The first is a crystal decanter that was given to his fiance at their engagement party. She died in a car accident, and this, along with the holotape talking about embezzling, might begin to tell you that Ezra wasn't that great of a guy. The next one along is a watch he got for his success as a venture capitalist two years before the war so now we know how he seemed to be so wealthy. The final one is another one that makes me think twice about him. It's a locket that apparently stopped a bullet meant for a Viscount that he dove in front of. But now all I can think is he arranged the assassination, they themselves were never in any real harm, and they got something from saving the Viscount. That's just pure speculation on my part, but we shall see if you agree with me by the end of the video. But so far, the memorabilia seems to indicate that he was a well-traveled man that lived a good life, and had a lot of success in it. Moreover, that he was a kind man, you know, if you're not as suspicious as we are. There are no more descriptions, but an assortment of weapons can be found throughout the room. On top of that, we find some flight gear, which suggests that he was a pilot of some sort. In his room, we can find the key to the overseer's office on his desk. Apart from that, there isn't much else here, so now it's time for a conversation about art with Santiago. It's a long one, so skip ahead if you'd like. Talk about the murder. There will be plenty of time for that. We have more important matters to attend to. Captain, 
come with me. Tell me, what does this piece say to you? It's about composition, the balance of colors and emotions, and the struggle to maintain internal order. Indeed. This was the last piece I did in a series of portraits of Gilda. Number 1378. Her emotional landscape is superimposed on the portrait. The reality of the subject is distorted as the ego attempts to project itself. This way. Tell me, what does this one say to you? It's the war. Bombs from every direction, no up or down, the world turned on its head. I suppose in a way it must be. Art shapes the world, and the world shapes art in return. All art must therefore be constantly reborn through the lens of contextual and historic interpretation. We must ascend. It's a metaphor. A young creature grappling with ideas it doesn't possess the capability to understand. Well, that's certainly a projected interpretation. Ah, well, truth be told, this is my best-selling piece. I did this series under a pseudonym, of course. This series has made more money than any of my serious works. And I take the whole thing as a lark. What does that tell you about the value of art to the common man, huh? Hello, detective. Here to broaden your mind through artistic inspiration. Did you have any thoughts about the murder? The person you should be looking at is Juliana Riggs. That Philistine would not know art from her own excrement. She and Ezra had a rather dramatic fight recently. You could hear her banshee screeches all the way across the hotel. What were Juliana and Ezra arguing about? I don't know. I was painting at the time and I was trying to block it out. So I bet Gildo probably heard them. Maybe you should check with her. I found red paint at the crime scene. Know anything about that? No, actually. Ezra borrowed my last gun and now I can't find it. I think you should explain why you keep returning to the crime scene. It's for inspiration, detective. The others do not like to think about it, but even we shall die someday. Like Prometheus's torch, it kindles within me the fire to create as much art as I can with the time that I have. It sounds like you've done a lot of paintings of Gilda. Why her? Our Gilda is a very singular creature, detective. Do you not see this what if from within her? I have never met another who clings to life so tenaciously. Who lives so in the moment. I must admit I was quite smitten with her for a time. You're still in love with Gilda, aren't you? So what if I am? What business is it of yours? She deserves someone who truly understands her ephemeral beauty. Not that brute actor. I think you're the murderer. You used Keith's bat to frame him, and left a trail of paint so we would find him. Oh, and what motive would I have to kill our dear Ezra? Maybe you could give me a reason it couldn't be you. No, detective. I do not need to go throwing around empty accusations as you do. You're still in love with Gilda, and you want to keep that of the picture. Just like my critics. Always willing to paint passion as madness. I see you have made up your mind. I am not going down without a fight. Now first and foremost, we get the most important information we uncover in this vault. Now we finally know who's been painting these fucking cat photos.
This one in particular was used in a weird murder shrine I covered almost two years ago. So now we finally have our answer. Another piece of information we get is that Santiago seems to have had, or does have, a bit of an obsession with Gilda, the actress who is with Keith. This hints, as I said, that there may have been a little more truth to the scene we interrupted. It also, he painted literally over a thousand paintings, either based on or inspired by her. So he certainly, at one point, saw her as a muse, going full telenovela again. We can flat out accuse him of being in love with her and being a murderer. He is clearly very jealous of Keith, kind of makes him a likely candidate for framing him, if, you know, Ezra hadn't taken the paint. Now unlike Keith, the man that he thought was a brute, he loses his shit when we accuse him and tries to kill us with paint. Despite that, he isn't the killer. The missing red paint, however, is suspicious. There's something small I would like to address. The hell has he been getting paint from for two centuries? And what's he going to do now that he's running out? Go outside and gather ingredients for more? Not likely. By the shelf that has the paint cans on it, we can find where he seems to seal the cans, but that doesn't really tell us where he gets it from. Incorrect accusations aside, he points us in the direction of Juliana Riggs, the wife of the man responsible for the current forms. She apparently had an argument with Ezra, a very vocal one. This and the missing red paint suggests that both of them were up to something. Before we go any further, I think we need to take a look at Santiago's surroundings to get a little more information on the man. Specifically, the enormous amount of alcohol that seems to be dotted around his studio, that, honestly, given his metal body, it seems unsafe. They can be found on both floors of it, and I think this is meant to paint Santiago as a tortured soul. The problem is, he's in an artificial body that, as far as I'm aware, filters out pretty much anything that could damage the brain. So I don't really see how he's even getting drunk, or even drinking. We need to look into Robobrains more, and we will, but as far as I'm aware, provided their fluid to preserve the brain is kept up, and they have power, they don't need to eat or drink. Moreover, I don't even think they have an intake for food, but I could be wrong. We'll leave that question to a more in-depth video regarding Robobrains. If I'm not, then this is all for show, and he placed these bottles here just to keep up appearances. His room next door to this is the most rundown of all the rooms. This suggests that robotic staff have been instructed to leave it alone, as they clean and maintain every other corner of the vault. This could be a more genuine reflection of how he feels, maybe because he lost Gilda, as we shall see. Or it could just be that he barely spends any time in here, and it ended up like this. After this is out of the way, we can go and have a conversation with Gilda, and see what Juliana and Ezra we're fighting about. If it isn't the brave detective, I haven't seen someone with a body like that in far, far too long. You're not so bad yourself. You should have seen me before all this. Red hair that was the envy of every girl and legs for days, darling. I'm sure you'd rather hear some of my stories from the silver screen rather than talk about that nasty murder business. I must say, you're quite the actress. What can I say? It just comes naturally. Care to hear some of my stories, Detective? All right. Keith and I first met when we acted together in Empire on the Nile. It was a period piece, huge production budget. He played Mark Antony, and I, of course, played Cleopatra. Ooh, how I hated that black hair, though. Sean Holzman, he was the director, you see. Well, he threw the most lavish set parties. They were absolutely Bacchanalian. Did you need something else? Tell me about yourself. My favorite subject. Simply put, darling, I'm the greatest actress in the world. When this international scuffle blows over, I shall return to the silver screen and lead the world to a new golden age of cinema. Did you need something else? Apparently, Juliana had a big argument with Ezra a few days before he died. Did you happen to overhear any of the conversation? Oh, yes. I haven't seen a woman go off like that since Teresa Dubois fired her costume designer. But to get back to your question, it was Fever Pitch Detective. She had apparently gone to the Overseer's office to check on the state of things and found it in horrible disrepair. But, and this is where it gets interesting, it sounded like she found something that really set her off. Couldn't hear what, though. Did you need something else? 
I found Keith's baseball bat at the scene of the murder. Any thoughts on how it got there? I don't know, Detective. I can't really imagine Keith killing Ezra. Did you need something else? I've gotten the impression you've had an affair with Santiago. Look, I love Keith, I do. But sometimes he just can't give me the attention I need. A girl gets lonely, Detective. It only lasted a few dozen years. The man's a bit much, even for me. Did you need something else? What were you and Keith talking about when I came in? Oh, that? We were rehearsing! Gotta stay sharp before going to rebuild Hollywood. But Keith always gets flustered when he's upset. Did you need something else? Did you have any thoughts about the murder? Well, it is a bit strange how obsessed Santiago has been with the murder. I mean, he's always been a bit obsessive, though. He did a whole series of paintings of me, hundreds, said I was his muse. It was flattering for a while, but the man is a bit much. Even for me, did you need something else? Maybe later. I'll be around, languishing from your inattention. So Gilda is... a lot. And yes, I flirted with her. It was all for the case, though. Now, I'm not sure if she has any more stories about Hollywood. Sometimes you get a new one, sometimes a repeat. But for the purposes of what was going on here, I didn't think wasting any more time on us was important. Gilda states that she started the affair with Santiago because she felt she wasn't getting enough attention from Keith. Given what we now know about Keith's feelings for Ezra, we can assume this is the reason. She outright admits that she was having an affair with Santiago and says it went on for a few dozen years. Another indicator, along with Keith's, that they are, to a certain extent, aware of the passage of time. But her comments about why Juliana went to the overseer's office are very odd. If it was already in disrepair, and this fight happened recently, then it must have been years since they had seen them. Given the logs, I think over a century is more likely. So how did none of them think to check or know something had happened? Just another piece of evidence that either their perception of time or the way they pay attention to the world is slipping. But more on that later. I expect what Juliana found was the information regarding the possible embezzlement, which then puts her at the top of the suspect list, as she has a motive. Also, we've kind of ruled out everyone else. Now to go and take a look at both Juliana and Bert, who we can find having a discussion in their shared room. So this is Bert and Juliana, the last two robo-brains we need to look at. Now I know you have questions about the cat, and believe me, we'll get into that very soon. But first, let's unpack everything that was said here. First of all, when Juliana makes a mistake, Bert begins to talk about the neural interface matrix, which is presumably how the brain interfaces with the rest of their body. Given he thinks taking a look at it would address the memory issues she's having, we can conclude that it plays a role in that as well. This turns out to be the case, as we'll get more information from Bert later. The second thing is she thinks she caught something when Pearl was sent out. Now Pearl is a robot who mans a souvenir shop. This is who Maxwell was referring to when they said they'd sent someone out for help. 
you can actually encounter them outside the vault with a note, wherein they ask for help from the authorities. Yet, another comment that is strangely out of touch with the world outside the vault. Again, I don't really see how this would have helped, as Pearl would have no idea about the outside world. Lastly, Bert is a doctor of robotics, which means he's the one who put their brains in their current bodies. Also, yes, a doctor is someone with a doctor degree, not just someone who practices medicine. Shut the fuck up, Juliana. Now, I said I'd talk about the cats. Yes, plural. There are four urns in the stove, one fallen beside it, and based on the names Missy 1, 2, and 4, there's another one missing. Counting Mr. Whiskers and Scruffy, that is about 10 cats in total. It's been over two centuries, so unless these cats are very long-lived, there should be more. Additionally, where do they keep coming from? Cats generally have litters, and obviously you need two for that to happen. So really this vault should be full of them. Or at least there should be way more urns. From the conversation between the two of them, we can conclude that Juliana is a bit of a germaphobe, or has some phobia related to illness. The radiation scrubbers and what I assume is some sort of disinfectant spray at the entrance backs this up. This is ironic as the room looks like it belongs to a hoarder. Furniture, paintings and milk are just thrown about the place and falling into severe disrepair. You'll find out what all this is later when we talk to her. Also, pets in general aren't known for their cleanliness, so you'd think they wouldn't want to own so many of them. I would have thought as well that, given her overall physiology change, she'd have gotten over this, as Bert points out they can't get sick, but I guess some things just stick around. Before we talk to her, we can head over to the classroom and have a very interesting conversation with Bert, one I will likely return to in later videos due to its information regarding Robobrains. Did you have any thoughts about the murder? Oh, well, that's not really my field of expertise, but I'm sure there are probably some clues at the crime scene. Oh, was there something else, Detective? Tell me about yourself. Oh, uh, well, I'm a scientist. You've probably met my wife, Juliana, already. I'm not sure what else to say, really. Oh, was there something else, Detective? Tell me about your research. Well, I was one of the leads on the team that created the first Robobrains, the precursors uh, to our model. Uh, most people don't find it all that interesting, and I, I'd rather not bore you. Oh, was there something else, Detective? I'd like to hear more about your research. Oh, wonderful. Uh, no one else here really wants to talk about it. Functionally, this model is more or less the same as the previous versions I worked on, I've, but without the neural inhibitor and the reconditioning. The voice modulator uh, seems to have some minor issues interfacing with the neural matrix, uh, which can add some moodiness. Uh, but that's easily solved with regular tune-ups. Oh, was there something else, Detective? I'd like to hear more about your research. I'm afraid that's really all I should say about it. I mean, it is still classified, but I wanted to help with the investigation. Oh, was there something else, Detective? I heard that Juliana and Ezra had an argument a few days before he was found dead. Tell me about that. Well, I was in my lab at the time, so I didn't, I didn't hear it. But Juliana has always been rather critical of Mr. Parker. I think she found something in the overseer's office. I wasn't listening when she told me about it. I kind of had my head in my research. I don't know, really. I tried to let her handle all the money stuff. Oh, was there something else, Detective? Robobrains have a voice modulator. Tell me about that. Uh, that's what allows us to recreate our original voices. Uh, they can mimic any normal human voice, actually. I've speculated for some time that the issues we had with our um, uh, uh, recruited subjects uh, is due to the brain attempting to preserve a sense of self. Uh, maintaining our original voices helps reinforce the neural network, uh, sort of like uh, playing music for an Alzheimer patient. Oh, was there something else, Detective? Maybe later. Very well, I'll just get back to my work then. 
I'd like to hear more about your reason. I'm afraid that's really all. Never mind. Very well. I'll just get back to my work then. Now, what I'm very interested in from him is his comments regarding Robobrains. Specifically that their models are a generation ahead of the first ones. We'll need to discuss in later videos as to whether or not the models that we encounter are indeed from that first generation. The part about the neural inhibitors and reconditioning actually explains a lot. Other robobrains we encounter are just that. Robots that utilize the brain as a processor, as opposed to humans that have discarded their bodies. The inhibitors and reconditioning are likely utilized to strip out anything that would remain of the person, as really all they need is the biological computer. The voice modulator for their models have some issues with it interfacing with the neural interface, and this is likely what he wanted to fix with Juliana, something she was hesitant to happen. Remember that. The moodiness might play a greater role into the oddness of the individuals here, but more on that later. Now his statement about recruited subjects suggests he knows that wasn't the case, and they were forced into it, but that's a story for another time. What is interesting is his comment regarding the overall behavioural issues coming from the brain trying to reassert the sense of self, likely resisting the inhibitors and reconditioning. Their use of original voices seems to assist this process, which, given they don't have the inhibitors or reconditioning, implies that the sense of self may degrade over time anyway. This is likely the cause of the moodiness, due to the issues with the voice modulator interfacing with the neural matrix, as the use of their voices helps stave off issues of degradation. He also mentions one more thing, the voice modulator can mimic any human voice, so with all this in mind, it's time to talk to Juliana. Did you have any thoughts about the murder? If you ask me, it's one of those actors. Or that horrible painter. Their type is always the cause of violence. I heard you had a big fight with Ezra a few days ago. Care to explain? Oh, well, it wasn't that big a deal, really. He wanted more money to pay for repairs on the hotel. I wasn't feeling well that day and lashed out a bit at the poor man. I really should have listened to him more. I found some evidence that Ezra was embezzling from you and the other investors. Oh, well, I really don't believe that. Mr. Parker wouldn't do such a thing, I'm sure. What's with all the junk in here? These are our things. We're just waiting till the war blows over so we can bring them back to the mansion. I think you're the real murderer. <laughs> That's just silly, detective. Why would I want to kill Mr. Parker? Maybe you could give me a reason it couldn't be you. I'm sick all the time, detective. I don't have the strength to do such a thing. Ezra was embezzling your money. That's why you killed him and framed Keith. You were so close, detective. It's a shame. I thought I could keep the ruse going a little longer. Oh, well. Had to end eventually, I suppose. This doesn't have to end in more violence, detective. Just walk away. I'll leave, and you can tell them I escaped. Ezra? You're alive. Well, congratulations on catching up, detective. Yes, I've been masquerading as Juliana for some time now. What's it going to be, detective? Join me in getting rich? Or die defending some outdated ideals? Why did you kill Juliana? I hadn't planned on it, but Juliana figured out what I was doing and had to be dealt with swiftly. I thought I could get a bit more money out of this place before making my escape. Well, how is this going to go down? If I'm gonna let you go, I want a cut of what you've stolen. Ah, uh, so it's like that, eh? Fine. I'll grease your palm a bit, detective. Now, am I free to go?
Okay, I'll let you go. Well, I'm glad you've decided to be reasonable. I would have hated for this to come to more bloodshed. All right, detective. Tell Maxwell that it's over and get your reward. Then I'll make my way out when things have died down. So first of all, the reason this room is so packed with stuff is because they want to move it all back into their mansion. Again, odd comment about the world outside. Second, sweet Moses Juliana was actually Ezra the whole time. Who could have seen that coming? Honestly, unless you paid attention to Bert's dialogue, you probably wouldn't have, so this was actually a really fun twist to the end of this quest. Props to the writers for this. Now you do have the option of letting Ezra go. If you do, he just... well, he, he just leaves. To be honest, I don't know where he goes. He enters the elevator, and when you get out, he's gone. Given what seems like complete ignorance of the outside world, I don't know where he was planning to go, or where he ends up going. So this isn't the right option. Neither is killing him. The only right option is to take that bribe, then go out and immediately tout to Maxwell. And then, this glorious scene unfolds. Hello again, detective. Was there anything else? I found Ezra. He killed Juliana, and he's been impersonating her. Oh, my. I'll notify the staff and we can put an end to this once and for all. I love this, and was laughing my ass off the whole time. It is definitely what he deserves. Off of his body, we can get the key to the other part of the vault, the part that he was embezzling the money for, and then we can wrap up this story. I'm sure you, like me, still have questions. So we'll sort it all out at the end. To get into the closed off section, you need to use the key, and it brings you to a large underground garage. This links up with the elevator that the vault door in front of the hotel opens onto. Now looking around the garage, there are way more than 10 spaces. Given the upper limit on the wealthy class was 10, they were apparently allowed to bring more than one car each which really sums up this whole vault nicely. The door up top is likely the door the overseer was referring to, so it's odd we didn't find any bodies up there, suggesting they did, in fact, survive. If it wasn't the door up top, then it would have been the main vault door, but to me that would just increase the chance that people would survive. Moreover, it makes more sense they came down from above, as this is how we entered Vault 111. The entrance to the second wing of the vault can be found in between two of the storage spaces, Inside, we can see that a lot of work was still being done, and some equipment can still be found here. From the large digger, it seems that even the cavern to put the wing in hadn't been fully excavated yet. Along with that, we can only find one room at the back that has even begun to be built, and it actually connects onto one of the car doors in the main vault. I wonder then, given the smashed in wall we came through, if this wasn't to be the true entrance. It did say they were to be taken through the main wing of the vault to show them what they didn't have access to and start the resentment. I think it's likely this was meant to be the entrance and it was sealed off during construction. So this was Vault 118, one of the stranger we've seen, and not because of how the experiment turned out, but how it was completely turned on its head. The original experiment would place a small number of the wealthy in a position of total power over hundreds of people. They would get to live in luxury, and others would live in squalor. The wealthy individuals, as stated in both the lobby terminal and the overseer logs, were to be recruited from the hotel. Here, the vault was advertised as a luxury, an experience only a few could afford. It wasn't a secret it was there, just exclusive. Presumably, after getting people to stay a while, they would convince them to make the vault their choice during the fallout. Or they would already be here on a holiday when it happened, as the experiment just needed them to be present to begin. The working class was to be taken in from the surrounding island of Far Harbor. I assume this was done in a similar manner in which we were taken in at the start of the game. It is here that the experiment was meant to begin, with the working class being put in cramped, lower quality accommodation, and the wealthy given control over their lives and complete immunity from all crimes committed against them. Overall, I guess the end result here would be all out vault civil war. Which, I mean, that's not a rare thing with vaults. Happens quite a bit, to be honest.
The experiment never took place, however. Ezra Parker, the venture capitalist, came forward to fund the construction of the vault, along with several other investors, Gilda and Keith, Santiago, and lastly, Juliana and Bert. Now due to their investments, they were allowed to control construction of the vault and had it prepared to their specifications. This was all within the parameters of the experiment. Given we are told that all the construction and finance was controlled by investors, and Ezra financed the hotel above as well, I assume it came first. Whether it was built along with the vaults, and the vault opened later, or they approached Ezra with the offer after he constructed the hotel, and he seen an opportunity, I'm not sure. Though given what we now know regarding Ezra, I think it was the latter. But at some point, Ezra started stealing money from the investors, and stalled construction on the second wing, for the working class. He could have just done it for the money, but he may also have wanted to prevent the possibility of having to share the vault with anyone else, i.e. the second group to come in. At some point in time, Bert, despite his research apparently being classified, somehow managed to get them all next generation Robobrain bodies based off of his research. This seems to have happened directly before the bombs fell, as the experiment wasn't changed and the overseer's next entry is about the doors not opening. Also given the plaque with the pocket watch, it's reasonable to assume Ezra was not a Robobrain when he received it. It remains unanswered how this happened. If they funded everything, then they could have had the vault built to give them total control and vault was unaware. Or they were, and were interested in this new experiment, and didn't care that it left some of their own inside. Another possibility is Bert managed to do it, as given his robotics expertise. Compromising the security of the vault is unlikely to have been a particularly tall order for him. Now when we arrive, it's been a whole two centuries, with some change, and we need to talk about how things are when we get here. There are quite a few things that don't make sense. The first is all of their comments about the outside world, and after the war. Moving things back into a mansion, resurrecting Hollywood, making an escape, getting the police by sending Pearl. Although that was Maxwell, so he doesn't have as much intelligence, or at least sentience. They all just believe we are a detective, without questioning where we came from, or even asking us about the outside world. They could have just been playing along, but I wonder if it is more than that, and it comes back to the memory issues Bert alluded to. If they've been active as Robobrain so long, they should be displaying the same issues we see in most. That this is not the case is explained by Bert, as they didn't undergo reconditioning, have any neural inhibitors, and they can use their own voices, which, again, according to Bert, helps the brain hold on to its sense of self. But there is the issue of the voice modulator interfacing with the neural matrix. Due to this, either the reinforcement by their own voice isn't as effective, or it's altered slightly. Either way, given Bert thought a tune-up would remedy Juliana's memory issues, I think it's safe to say that without the tune-ups, the sense of self degrades. This could be happening anyway, regardless of tune-ups, and so explains all of their odd comments about the outside world. They know that it's been 200 years, but they don't seem to understand just what that passage of time has done to everything else, that their old lives are gone. They mention waiting out the war more than once, and I think they are all under the misconception that it's still ongoing, that the world above will be waiting for them when it's all over, as opposed to being completely altered. The second odd thing is that Juliana, and it seems only her, took over a century, maybe two, given the murder only just seems to have happened, to check in the overseer. They've been dead a long time, but only now are they realizing what's happened. It could just be that they're all egotistical, and never thought to check, but two centuries is a stretch. I think it's more likely that their memories are being affected, and they forgot the overseer existed. Now this may not be just limited to memory, it could be affecting their overall sense of self as well. This could explain why they are all so dramatic and over the top, apart from Bert, but then he is the expert in Robobrains, so probably tunes himself more frequently than he does the rest. You're probably thinking that they could have been like this before they became Robobrains, and yeah, there's a chance that's the case, but it could be that they've degraded and, over time, their personalities are becoming more exaggerated and extreme. They could also just be going slightly mad after 200 years. My most spinfoil hat theory is that, apart from Bert, as he needs to do the tune-ups, all of them have swapped their voices and identifying clothing more than once, and as a result, their sense of self is rapidly slipping, as they are using different voices. This, combined with their limited knowledge of the others, leads to the personas we see before us, straight out of a soap opera or a telenovela. I have no evidence of this, but I do like the theory. In the end, Juliana discovered Ezra's betrayal, albeit two centuries later. I think his plot of getting more money out of this place, and that they are still giving it, 
is more evidence that they don't know what has happened to the world. Sure, he has the only key to the other wing, so they couldn't check the work. But who did they think was working on it? The only way this would make sense is if they thought the world hadn't been engulfed in nuclear fire. It is a little strange why they think this, however. To the best of our knowledge, they've made no effort to believe the vault that we know of in two centuries. Along with this, they had full control of the vault, so presumably had control over the tools used to monitor the outside world as well. Additionally, if they did know it was gone, why did they think the money still mattered? Ezra gives us money if we ask for it, but it's pre-war. Maxwell, however, pays us in caps, which suggests he knows what the currency is now. Additionally, he didn't destroy the overseer's holotape despite being aware of it, as otherwise he wouldn't have sealed up the office. I think this is more evidence that even Ezra was degrading. Him posing as Juliana may have accelerated this process, as we don't know exactly how much time has passed. But on the whole, I think they are very much in the dark, or maybe just in denial, that the world they once stood on top of, and gave up so much to survive to see again, is already gone. This current vault experiment, if you can even call it that, involved near immortal, wealthy people living out a life of luxury underground, and slowly fading away. It may be that this was just a bad time in between tune-ups, and they could have been fine after them. If not, then they will die in this vault, shadows of their former selves. The Overseer was the only other subject, and they succumbed to the experiment a long, long time ago. And totally deserved it. We don't know if those in Group B died outside, or managed to settle elsewhere. Regardless, I feel like they dodged a bullet, as the alternative to out there was a life of squalor and tyranny, to be ruled over, and have their descendants ruled over, by the long-lived privileged of Vault 118.